Hello everyone, my name is Jonas, I'm a conference organizer at the Handelsblatt Media Group and I would like to welcome you all to our webinar on privacy practices for connected car data. I'd also like to welcome our host, speaker uh, Lisa Joy Rosner, who's talking for, to us directly from the Silicon Valley. She's working for Autonomo, one of the leading neutral automotive data service platforms, and is a partner at our upcoming conference Monetizing Car Data in spring next year. If you'd like to ask any questions, please feel free to use the window on the right side of your screen. And so, Lisa, the, ses the session is yours. So please start. Great. Well, thank you so much. And we have an international group of people on the phone today. So I'd like to welcome everyone and say good morning and good afternoon and good evening. It's a complete pleasure to be here speaking to you today. I wanted to start off by just telling you a little bit about myself so you can see the the face behind the voice oops um i ha as 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 you were told i uh, am the chief marketing officer at autonomo and i'm talking to you from silicon valley i have been working in data and analytics for over 20 years i've worked at both uh, large public companies like Newstar and Broadvision, and a bunch of really cool and interesting startups in both retail and, and social media. And I started my career at Oracle, so I'm a real uh, data junkie, and um, I'm really excited to see how we're applying data in the auto tech space. So I'm gonna start off by just telling you just a little bit of, of who we are and what we do as background. So, I think everyone here knows that, that the car data story is a big data story, and it's a really big, big data story today, and will be growing very much over the next uh, several years. And the data that's coming out of cars is coming um, right now at a very rapid pace. We're seeing um, data about anywhere from um, five to 500 parameters that's coming out of vehicles. It can come in as, as much as 25 gigabytes an hour. And that data varies a lot by make and model, by type. There's a lot of diversity in the structure of that data and the way that it is communicated. And what we do is we take that data that is so diverse and we shape, we reshape it into one, um, harmonized, normalized format, but also we protect that data. Uh, we'll be talking about this a lot today because our topic is around uh, privacy uh, protection. And we also enrich that data. We make it uh, infinitely smarter and infinitely better. And we also make it accessible. So one of the most important things in, in the data, in the, the automotive data services world is our APIs. But at the end of the day, you know, what we're doing is transforming car data into apps and services and really helping to make that happen. So very simply, our goal here, all of us, is to make our drivers really happy, to make their experiences in the car just more delightful every day, whether it's um, making sure the car is running through predictive maintenance or a whole host of concierge services, which I'll be talking about. But at the end of the day, our mission here is to do good with data and to make drivers' lives better. And I think that's something we all agree upon. And so just very quickly, so you understand, you know, who we are and why we're here and why we're talking to you today about data privacy, this is how Autonomo works. Um, we don't have anything in the car, we have everything in the cloud. So we work with OEMs all around the world, all of whom are collecting data at, at varying, varying degrees of sophistication today and storing that data in their cloud. We then access that data through APIs, and as you can see, the data comes out of the cars in many different formats and shapes. It goes through our cloud data lake. We have a security layer, a privacy layer, and, and then all the reshaping and enrichment, and then the data comes out and it's app ready, and then we license that data to a whole variety of apps and services, and then in return, we deliver value back to the OEMs. That's very quickly who we are, but let, let's jump into what are people doing with the data? 
So this is uh, an autonomo analysis. It's called the autograph. And what it shows is by market maturity and value potential per vehicle, where we see the market is. And so you see that, that it's really, it's, it's a growing and evolving marketplace. And at the top, we see that you know, fleet management and insurance is the most mature. And by the way, you know, we've written articles. I'm, I'm happy to share more of this. This is just a very high level view. And we see you know, predictive maintenance and subscription-based fueling as being potentially high value, but still early in the market. And, and Smart City right in the middle, um, financial services, media ratings, um, the most mature, but perhaps not the most lucrative in dollars, but very high value to consumers are, are anything around navigation and mapping. So as you can see, there's a real diverse landscape in various levels of maturity today, but we are seeing, seeing even since this chart was put together in June, um, some really rapid movement and maturity in this space. So, so you know, our goal is to take the data and, and do good with it and, and make it available and smart for usage. So when you deal with data, there's, there's always the issue of how do consumers feel? So uh, in, in the, the spring of 2018, we decided to ask consumers who own connected cars in the United States so a couple of questions about connected car data and privacy. And what we learned was really interesting. We surveyed over a thousand consumers across the United States. And I will point out that right now we have a survey in the field that will be going through the early uh, parts of 2020, asking similar questions to consumers across all of Europe. And I'll be sharing those with you um, in, in early 2020. But what, what American drivers told us is that we asked them, do you want connected car services? They said, absolutely. And then we told them to get those services, you need to share your data. Is that okay? I thought that number was going to be very, very low and was shocked to see that 80% of connected car owners who want services are willing to share their data. 95% of them said that the thing that will help them share their data is trust. Trust is the most important thing. And 77% of them, when we ask them who they trust, the number one person, the number one entity they, they trust at, at almost 80% uh, is their bank and then their carrier. But 77% of connected car owners trust their OEMs, which is great news for OEMs. Uh, but what they want is transparency. And that's part of what I'm going to be talking about today is how do we give consumers the trust and the transparency that they need to reap the benefits of connected car data services. So as I said, you know, there, there's so much going on with the data, but, but who, who controls that data? So there's a really big debate. I was in Brussels two weeks ago at the, the IAPP sitting on a panel with a bunch of um, regulators and, and legislators and, and data privacy experts. And it really is a, a, a very hot debate about who controls the data. But from, from our, our vantage point at Autonomo, we feel that the most important thing is to protect consumers and their rights and to give them choices. And so to do that, um, we have to make sure that we um, are compliant with regulation. And there's regulation all across the globe. Um, it is most mature and sophisticated uh, in GDPR. I'm here in Silicon Valley in California where CCPA is um, about to come in effect. And there's, there's regulation all throughout Asia and the rest of the world. And I think, you know, I have some summaries here of, of the things that are important, the right to erasure, um, not selling personal data, the right to object, the right to be informed. All of this is, is really, um, it's important and and you know what you'll hear as we go through the playbook is that it's also it boils down to just being respectful of consumers that's that's when we talk to consumers that's what they tell us they want so what we did that um, it's so you know as i was saying it's more than just compliance 
it, it, yes, we all have to be compliant. There are laws, but what's, what this is really about is about building trust. As I said, 77% of consumers say they trust their OEMs. And I think our goal collectively is to get the industry where that trust level goes up even higher and, and it boils down to communication. And so what we've done at Autonomo is we partnered um, with the Future of Privacy Forum and a number of um, lawyers who are uh, car data experts, and we put together a playbook. It's, it's really, for, um, it has nine plays for how to build trust with consumers. It's just a framework. It's not a legal document. It's just a guidebook, a checklist of things. And uh, we will be sending it to everybody who's who's registered for this event today. So you can look for that in your, your inbox. But what I'm going to be doing today is just giving you a high level overview of the nine plays. It's just giving you a taste. And then you know you can you can read about it in more detail or reach out to any of us and we'd be more than happy to help. So let's let's jump in. Play number one. So OEMs are the stewards of connected car data. When, when a car is sold, consumers grant stewardship to the OEM. But what consumers want is still to be able to exercise their right. And so play number one is around creating an end-to-end -end consent management an opt-out signaling system. Um, just like with the phone, people want to be able to turn on and off access to their data. And what you see here is, is um, a, a product that Autonomo has, which is a consent management hub that is, is uh, an app that can be private labeled where consumers can grant and revoke consent to their data and have full transparency. But really play number one is about making sure that consent is easy to grant and to revoke. And play number two is similar but different. This is really about an act of goodwill. And that is about offering choices even when it's not legally required. There are lots of laws and lots of things that we, we have to do, we have no choice. But when you think about someone like Apple, Apple is extremely transparent, they share how your data is being used, even when it's not legally required. Or with, with different, um, uh, like with Microsoft, they, they let you know that you have a choice whether or not to share your error information. And by sharing it, you help them get smarter. But you can, you can take that, that privilege away if you want, but they, but they, they, make, they give you choices even when you don't have to. And that is something that really helps consumers feel trusted. So it's really about an act of goodwill. So play three, and, and this is the, the English major in me, this is really about turning into this entire process into a conversation. So play number three is about delivering information in transparent and engaging ways. So what do I mean about a transparent? First of all, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the interactions today are filled with legalese, words that, that just are not the way people speak or normally write, and it can confuse a consumer, or, or just they just click, 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 and they don't even know what they've agreed to. And so, so part of play number three is about using language, speaking in the most, most humanistic tone possible, and then about delivering that content, all your privacy policies and, and all the consent and, and, and all the you know, not, not obligated consent in formats that people can consume. Consumers, there's, you know, as we know, there's a whole broad uh, selection of demographics out there. Some people like to hold something in their hand, so pamphlets, um, you know, the millennials today like things in apps. Some people have short attention spans and they want videos. Sometimes they want to talk to a person. And so what's really important is having a multi-channel, multimedia strategy for delivering information about your privacy policy and about how data is being used in language that is really easy to understand so that consumers feel at ease and they, they understand. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about opening a dialogue and having a conversation with your consumers so that they feel 
that they're in control and they, they feel like they understand what's happening. Play number four is about, it's, it's really about being smart. And play number four is about applying the minimal viable data set to, to different use cases. So I have two different examples here. For example, just because the car is collecting a lot of data and you have a lot of data does not mean you have to transmit all of it. So for roadside assistance, you just need location and heading and impact event. There, you know, everything else that's, that's happening is not ne necessary. Um, for, for a use case like subscription-based fueling, which we've been piloting in, in a number of places all over the world, location, fuel level, and gas cap. But, but other information is, is really not necessary. So this is really about being smart. And you know when you're handling data, just making sure that you use the data that's necessary. Let's look at play five. So play five is an interesting one. You know, each use case um, needs different pieces of data, as we just talked about. And this is about making sure that data is de-identified within the context of the use case. And so we'll see this. So when we're looking at something like parking apps, um, ac accurate location is critical, but you don't need the driver's ID. So data can be, you know, blurred. You know, turned on and turned off, you know, or when we're looking at, at media, which is a really interesting use case, um, you know, the continuous driver ID is important, you know, at least by the trip. So again, a completely different uh, setup of, of anonymization. And it's really about making sure that you de-identify within the context of the use case. Let's go to play number six. So this one is really important. I feel that um, privacy and security are like peanut butter and jelly. You can't have you know you can't have one without the other. There is no privacy without security. And so play number six, I really think this is one of the most important ones. And, and I've worked in the security space as well. It is so important to have the right technology and process at every touch point from the car to the data set center to the endpoint to the service provider. There, there is no privacy without security. And so this play, it really should be play number one because it's, it's where it all starts. But um, any privacy policy is only as strong as the security systems that back it up. And I hope that makes sense to everyone. I wish I could see your faces. <laughs> so play number seven, I think is a really it's a really interesting one. It's also extremely humanistic. Um, I think that, you know, we have a diversity of people on the call today from, from across the whole ecosystem. And I think that it's incumbent upon all of us on the ecosystem to be doing public outreach. Because what's happening in the market, what has happened in the last couple of years is that when there's a story about connected car data, it can go into the negative. And I think it's incumbent upon us to be really highlighting and sharing the stories of all of the, the, the possibilities for car data, whether it's insurance or emergency services or predictive maintenance or all the concierge services from car wash to uh, trunk delivery to on-demand fueling to all the things that are that are coming. I mean, every time we have a brainstorm session there, we come up with you know, 10 new ideas for services. And I think that it's really up to us across the ecosystem to advocate. And you know, we have the privacy principles that have been developed by the OEMs, but consumers don't know about it. The Future of Privacy Forum has, has put together um, a, a wonderful booklet about personal uh, data in your car. But we should be getting out there and evangelizing and, and painting the picture of where this marketplace is going. Um, I think that the carriers have done a really good job evangelizing all the possibilities of smartphones. And I, I think that one of the things that we as an industry have to do is evangelize all the possibilities of smart vehicles. So play number eight. Play number eight is about thinking beyond a single vehicle driver. 
Um, our, our world of mobility is changing very rapidly. I, I see it happening all over the world, um, whether it's, I mean, let, let's start with the first one, um, the change of ownership. I, I, have a, I have a friend who bought a certified pre-owned vehicle, typed in home, and she got directions to the owner of the previous, you know, the, the previous owner's house in Los Angeles. Um, there, there was clearly a, a privacy violation there. the car was not wiped. And I think that, you know, maybe we need something like a universal wipe button. Or when there are multiple drivers in a car, perhaps an interface like Netflix. You know, on, we have, each one of my kids has their own channel on Netflix. It knows who they are and what they want. Um, right now, you know, in our car, you can set the, the seat to my legs versus my husband's legs. But, you know, you know, possibly figuring out how to accommodate multiple drivers entering a connected car. And then, of course, there's rental cars, there's ride sharing. I think, you know, as, as we think more and more about the usage of data, we have to think about what happens beyond one driver, one car. Then let's go to the last play. The last play is a really important one. I think this applies um, to really to, to, to every type of data, data storage. So it's really about establishing a data lifecycle strategy. Um, we, we say that storage is cheap, but risk is very important. So I think what, what's important is to have a strategy for every, every part of the life cycle, when the data is generated, to being ingested, validated, sent, you know, when you send it to the service provider, you retain that data, you archive it. But this to me is one of the most important things. I think a lot of companies forget about when to draw a line in the sand for destroying that data when you know it's it's important to retain an archive for certain use cases especially you know if you're you're trending or you're trying to understand what's happening in a vehicle but but one of the important strategies for uh, data in general but car data in specific is making sure that you have the processes in place for the entire life cycle and you have that line in the stand for when do we not need to hold this data anymore so this is a, this is a really important uh, final play. So, you know, I'm really gonna gonna uh, end here where I began. That there are, you know, we're, we're living in a world of GDPR and CCPA and APPI, and and I mean, here in the United States, it's going to be really interesting because the 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 compliance legislation is different from state to state, and the compliance is there to really keep us to the, I would say you know, the most important, and I would even say to some extent that, you know, the bare minimum of what we must do. Um, but I think that it's more than just compliance. It's about building trust. It's about building a relationship with your consumers and speaking to them in a language where they feel comfortable and taking all of these nine plays and fleshing them out across your enterprise so that your that, that really highly trusted relationship that we know we have with our consumers is is enhanced and uh, and, and continued over time. So I thought I would uh, end by just telling you a little bit more about Autonomo. Um, I'm here in Silicon Valley, but Autonomo is actually based in this beautiful city called Herzliya, Israel. We have about 80 employees across the globe with the R&D center in Israel and teams on the ground in the U.S. in Silicon Valley and Detroit and, and in, the, in the New York and D.C. area. We have a team on the ground in uh, throughout Europe in, in Stuttgart and Berlin and in uh, the Netherlands and we have a team on the ground in, in Japan in the Tokyo, Tokyo area. So we're, we're a small but, but mighty team around the globe. Um, and as I started by talking about big data, um, we, we've curated about 192 billion miles from, from 18 million vehicles, and our system is really powerful. We, we ingest over 2 billion data points a day, and we have relationships with about 15 OEMs um, across the globe. And what you see here are just highlights of um, some of the data that we have around the world. So, this gets us to the, the end of the presentation um, and gives us time for some Q&A. And so um, I'm, I'm hoping that we have some questions. I'd love 
Stone, who are on the on the um, the webinar. And so we have some questions here. Um, first question is: What car data is really accessible to autonomous level? Um, so um, on ECU level, uh, communication level, or what else? So. Um, we have car data, as I said, from, from 18 million vehicles across the globe, um, a variety of different um, parameters. Um, some of the data is aggregate and anonymized. Some of it is for personal use cases. Um, some of the more interesting personal use cases are around EV management, um, and we're working on some for insurance. Um, a lot of the data is aggregate that is for you know, traffic, traffic and, and mapping and, and smart city, uh, those kinds of use cases. So um, I hope uh, you, I hope that, that that answers your question. So the next question. So have you solved the two-way consent issue most OEMs are reluctant to approve? So at the highest level, I would say yes. We have something called a consent management hub, and we're also um, the neutral server of choice for, um, for Daimler. So uh, the consent management hub um, as I, it, can, you know, can be used to solve the two-way consent issue. And, and if that's something uh, that you're interested in, um, you see my email here, lisa at autonomo.io, reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with one of our, our engineers um, and we can give you more details about that. So next question, what use cases are you approved by the OEMs to pursue? So that's a really good question. And those use cases really vary by geography and by OEM type. So some use cases um, are purely aggregate, um, where we're just looking at um, you know, collections of data, they're not connected back to the individual driver, you know, completely anonymized. Um, and for those, you know, there's, it's, there's traffic data, mapping data, um, in other cases, there are personalized data, as I said, for whether it's um, you know, EV use cases or on-demand car wash use cases, they, they really vary um, by geography and by OEM type. So they, they, and we're really, we're prototyping, I mean, everything that you saw in the autograph is something that we've explored or tested or piloted um, across the globe, even things like um, just weather detection. So there's, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of different use cases. Okay, let's see what else. So here's another question. This one's uh, interesting. Evangelizing versus lobbying. If privacy legislation changes, database services will be in trouble. How can you make sure that you will fulfill worldwide data privacy legislation? That is an absolutely excellent question. And I think that, um, and I, I think you're right that, that uh, you know, one of the things I said is that that the legislation is so so different uh, based on geography, and and one of the things that we do at Autonomo is make sure that we adhere to the most strict policy, and then it, it's up to uh, the OEMs to decide how they want to use them by geography. So, I mean, I think that that it's just incumbent upon us. Um, to, you know, we have a chief privacy officer, we stay on top of, of legislation and make sure that we comply at, at every turn. And I, you know, I think that um, privacy compliance is really, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job for, for all of us that are in the data business. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm the chief marketing officer. I too, even in the way that I interact with data that comes in through our website, am, am obligated and we, in, in every geography, just make sure that we adhere to the most strict standard. So I hope that that answers your question. And if it's something that you would like to, to get discussed further, again, I invite any of you, if I didn't, if I don't get your question, because we're just about out of time, to email me and I'd be more than happy to engage in a dialogue with you personally or put you in touch with one of our subject matter experts. Let me see if I have, um, if there are any others. Okay, so last question. Consumers want choice as well as security. How does the autonomous system ensure manufacturers don't have an unfair advantage in terms of timing of receiving data which signals 
the, ve the vehicle has an issue. How does the autonomous system ensure manufacturers don't have an unfair advantage? Why would this be an, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question that, that they don't have an unfair advantage. I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question let me read it again. Consumers want choice as well as security. How does Autonomo ensure manufacturers don't have an unfair advantage of receiving data which signals the vehicle has an issue? I'm not sure how it's an, an unfair advantage. I think, you know, it's interesting when I was at the telematics update event in Detroit and we, we had an interactive conversation with the audience and we asked them what use case was their number one priority that they're working on it was predictive maintenance. And I think the whole goal of predictive maintenance is to make sure that you catch something before, before, before the, the vehicle breaks down. I just had my car uh, break down this week, uh, something that could have been caught, but my car didn't catch it. And so I, I actually see it as a fair advantage that helps um, notify the consumer before something happens. And so I think predictive maintenance is, is going to be one of the most popular once it's it's really implemented well. Um, I don't know if I answered your question properly on this one. So again, um, please feel free to reach out to me and, and I'll make sure that I get you the right answer. So uh, this puts us at exactly time. So I want to thank everyone for joining me from across the globe and different time zones. Um, thank you for your time. I, I hope that, that everybody got at least one little nugget of something that they can think about that's actionable for them. You know, as I said, we'll be sending you the, the playbook, which is just the beginning of this dialogue. And um, as I said at the beginning, we will be um, at Handelsblatt at the beginning of 2020. And um, please look for the results of our, our consumer study across Europe. Um, it's very exciting. I have no idea what's going to come back, but we will be sharing that data with the marketplace as we have it. So thank you, everyone. Um, we're in the holiday season. I wish you all a very happy holiday. And thank you for spending time with me today.